Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Eckerson Group webinar today. I'm Jed Summerton, VP of Consulting for Eckerson Group, and I'll be your host and moderator today. I'd like to start by saying that we intend this to be a unique type of webinar that we're calling a community forum. We have a series of topics, one per month, and we've designed them to be different from a standard webinar in five ways. First, we will discuss what we believe are unique topics. They are unique and critical to modern data-driven organizations. Second, our panelists are all experienced practitioners. We've lived through and helped shape some of the most valuable analytics programs in the world. Third, this is a community discussion. Please do contribute, and I'll cover those logistics in a minute. Fourth, we don't have a vendor sponsor for community forums. We pledge to be pure and give you our broad perspectives. And lastly, we offer a free companion report for you to download and consume at your leisure. We'll send you a link tomorrow in via email. As you can see, we have planned a series of forums, and this is our inaugural, with a goal to start the new year with topics that we hope will lead you toward a 2020 vision into data analytics. Today's topic is on the modern data analytics organization, and next month, we'll talk about bringing IT and the business together, and then in March, how to succeed with self-service analytics. First, let me introduce you to the Eckerson Group. We are a full-service analytics organization that has three parts, the research pioneered by Wayne, consulting, which I lead, and an education uh, organization that also delivers on-site courses as your needs require. Those three parts come together to provide holistic solutions and full support throughout the life cycle of analytics programs that we help our clients with. Speaking of clients, here's a list of the companies we have had the honor and privilege to serve. There, of course, are others, but these are the ones that uh, we have done recently. We are glad to have you today, and I'd like to thank you for joining. We are looking forward to diving into today's live production, and the topic today as I mentioned, is organizational frameworks for data analytics in a corporate data environment. Now, let me introduce our panelists. Wayne Eckerson, founder and president of Eckerson Group, is a preeminent analyst of the data and analytics industry. He has consulted to numerous firms globally, is a frequent keynote speaker in multiple industry events, and is the author of two books on data and analytics. Rich Fox is VP of Analytics and Data Science at Apex Park Group, where he is responsible for all data science opportunities across the business, designing and executing on the data analytics strategy. In case you're not familiar with Rich, he is a 20 year veteran practitioner in the analytics industry and is an experienced thought leader in bringing strong business expertise to strategy, design and use of analytics in a company, leaking key decisions to high value outcomes. I, Jed Summerton, will double as moderator and panelist contributing my experience as a longtime data and analytics consultant and former VP of data and analytics in a Fortune 200 healthcare provider. So that with the preliminaries, let me send it over to you, Wayne. Great, Jed. Thank you so much uh, for introducing our first ever Eckerson Group produced webinar. Of course, we participate in a lot of webinars, uh, but other people produce uh, those. Uh, and as a result of this being our inaugural webinar, we're trying a new format, this community forum, where we get a lot of participation from panelists and you, our listening audience. So we'd love your feedback on this new format and what you think. So this topic is one you don't see many webinars on because it's not technology driven. But to be honest, in my experience, 25 plus years in this industry, you know, the people, the process, and the organization are the keys to analytical success. And that's why we're, we're focusing on this topic for our first webinar. Now, I will say there's really no right or wrong way to organize your data analytics uh, team and environment. Uh, but after working with dozens of companies on a consulting basis and many, many more uh, from a research perspective, I've come to... Uh, understand that there are a few best practices, and I'd like to share those with you today. So first of all, uh, before we get to my framework for how to organize an analytic organization in a federated manner, it's important to know how most analytic groups evolve. And they don't evolve because they listen to me or another consultant with a model. Usually they evolve fairly organically. And in fact, what I've seen is that most start with a decentralized focus, uh, either because one or two people in a department started building reports and dashboards on their own initiative, followed by others independently in other departments, or 
maybe they started with a centralized group and then through mergers and acquisitions, they became decentralized. Now, there's some good things about a decentralized organizational model. One, the people who are building the reports and the solutions sit in the business. In fact, they feel that they're part of the business. Uh, They're part of the team. They know the people. They know the language, the politics. And to be honest, they know what the business wants before they even have to ask for it. So they're very business driven. And because of that, uh, usually they can build solutions that are very agile, uh, faster, better, cheaper. In fact, some of the best BI analytical solutions I've seen have been built by departments. Um, So those are two good things. But on the downside, as you can see and imagine, there are a lot of silos, siloed uh, teams, uh, lots of different BI teams, a lot of redundancy in tools, in data sets, in reports, which create conflicting data, conflicting reports, confusing users, especially at the executive level of which data they should trust. Uh, And also because of the redundancy, uh, there's a lot of cost ineffectiveness, right? Uh, Excess costs. So when a CEO or a CFO looks at this decentralized model, they start pulling their hair out. The CEO says, you know, this is the reason why I ask a simple question like, how many customers do we have? And it takes a week or two before I can get an answer, which I don't even trust. And the CFO looks at this model and sees all the waste and redundancy and thinks, oh, there's got to be a better way. we got to cut costs here. So if you were a CEO or a CFO looking at the decentralized model, what would you do? Well, of course, you would centralize uh, and take all the people doing BI in the departments and put them on a central team. And that's great because now you'll get a standard architecture, standard set of tools, You'll get standard data, standard reports, and for the CFO, you get economies of scale and cost savings. But there's a couple of big problems with the centralized approach, which I'm sure many of you have experienced, and that is from day one of forming this central team, you have a development backlog. And all of a sudden, all the business units and departments that used to have their own analysts now have to stand in line and wait for scarce resources and wait and wait and wait for weeks or months to get someone to pay attention to them. And then when they do, it takes another couple of weeks or months to get anything built because those people have lost all domain knowledge of what's going on in that business unit or department. Now, uh, say a year or two later, the, the CEO and CFO look at the centralized model and they see this backlog and they hear all the complaints from frustrated users and they see some business unit heads have taken matters, matters into their own hand Uh, and use their own budget to hire back developers that were taken from them to build their own local reports and dashboards. Uh, And they they say, you know, something's got to be done here. (laughs) A lot of times they'll say, oh, let's just, uh, you know, slash this budget because this team's not working or outsource it or offshore it. Uh, But if they're smart, they would do something else. And that is they'll take uh, the best of the decentralized model and the centralized model, and they'll create a federated model. Uh, And and this really does provide the best of both worlds and minimizes the downsides of each. It gives you economies of scale, standard enterprise architecture, which helps deliver standard data and reports, uh, as well as by having people out in the departments and the business units, a very agile, self-service, business-driven environment that's gonna satisfy most business users. So that's the context for my framework for a modern data organization, why I call this a federated model. So let's dive into the, into the model itself. I've got two slides for that. So this is a conceptual model of a federated program. Um, so when I say program, what does that mean? That's a very vague word and, and people define it in many different ways. But for the purpose of this presentation, a program is uh, an organizational framework that spans all the people, processes, and technologies involved with data and analytics across the enterprise. So here's the model at a very high level um, using a block diagram. Uh, And let's start with the blue box on the left, the business unit analyst teams. And this is where 
embedded data analysts are. They sit in each business unit or department, whether it's marketing, sales, finance, usually has a team of data analysts who are really domain specialists. They don't think of themselves as technologists, even though they're building reports and dashboards. They think of themselves as business people who happen to write uh, reports and, and work with data, right? So more specifically, who are on these teams besides the manager? Uh, there are data analysts. Uh, these are what we used to call spreadsheet jockeys. Maybe we call them tableau jockeys now. Uh, report analysts, that's a term I use to refer to people out in the business units who are really glorified report developers who build and maintain reports because honestly, data analysts shouldn't be doing that work. Uh, and then we occasionally see a data scientist uh, embedded in the departments and maybe even a data engineer if it's big enough and has a lot of its own data, although that gets a little controversial. Now, the purpose of these teams really is to support the business unit leaders and managers. Uh, and usually these analysts are pulled by unit um, so that uh, you don't want to have just one assigned to one business department. One, they might get overloaded. And two, if they leave, the uh, department is left high and dry. And the purpose of these business unit analyst teams, for the most part, is to build local reports and models uh, that uh, encompass an analysis and answer questions that the business unit leaders might have. Okay, so let's look at the red box on the right side. Uh, this is the corporate data analytics team, and this is comprised of technical specialists, such as data architects, data engineers, BI developers, QA analysts, uh, data scientists, systems admins, and, and really the list goes on and on and on. And their job really is first and foremost to create and maintain curated data, uh, you know, repositories like data lakes, data warehouses, data marts, and, and even data sets to support specific projects and solutions. They also build stuff, uh, enterprise reports, because frankly, who else is going to do that? Uh, as well as complex apps that are beyond this, the ken of uh, the business unit analyst teams. Their goal in this day and age also is to facilitate self-service. In the old days, uh, this group used to build everything, but now we're trying to offload a lot of the building uh, to the local teams, as I just said. Uh, but to be honest, there's a lot of local groups and departments that don't have any capabilities to do that or interest to do that. And so the corporate data analytics team will continue in its uh, traditional role of building out local solutions for those groups if asked. Now, uh, that dotted purple line connecting the two, that's where all the fun starts. That's where this uh, federation begins. And it's, it's the key, one of the keys to the federated model. And what it really means is that these analysts who in most organizations are hired by the business unit leaders and, and, and that's all they know and that's all they do, now they have a reporting responsibility to the corporate analytics team. And that's either a straight line, so they report to the corporate data analytics team with a dotted line to the business unit head, or it's the reverse. And in fact, I've seen it both ways uh, with different clients that we've had, uh, and both ways work. Uh, but what's important is that the following happens, is that there's a two-way street. So the corporate data and analytics team, if this is done right, it's their responsibility to hire, well, to recruit, to hire, to train, and do the quarterly or annual performance reviews for these analysts out in the business units. And that ensures that they're getting, the business units get top quality analysts who can support their needs effectively. It's, uh, they're also responsible for uh, conveying best practices and standards. So uh, ideally, the corporate data analytics team has a master chart of how things are done uh, and what standards in place for metrics and processes to make things easier on the business unit analysts when they build stuff so they don't have to think so much and create things from scratch uh, with those best practices and standards they get a leg up and can be more effective uh, and increase their time to insight for their business units. And finally, to support self-service, um, they provide coaching, um, uh, support, 
um, through data labs, uh, through um, uh, meetings, um, through one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings as well. So that's what the corporate data analytics team provides to the business units. And in return, uh, the business units offload some local development. And they also serve as the eyes and ears of the corporate data analytics team in each of the business units. And one of the big things they can help do is identify and consolidate requirements, especially if the corporate team needs to build some enterprise solution. And then also because they're working very closely with individuals in the business units, they can help improve data literacy. Uh, and hopefully that is put on their radar screen by the corporate data analytics team, which has its own data literacy initiative, ideally. Uh, so, uh, cross-functional oversight, this is also very important. This group is a cross-functional team uh, of analyst, business unit analyst managers, for the most part, uh, and they serve essentially as a board of directors uh, to approve strategy and funding of the enterprise data analytics program. Uh, they help prioritize projects that the corporate data analytics team builds, uh, they define standards for metrics uh, and tools uh, and best practices, or at least they approve those that are brought to them by the corporate data analytics team, and much more as we'll see in the next slide. But it's really important if, to have a business-driven program, and a key to that is to have essentially a business-driven board of directors. Now, this cross-functional form, this is where we take the embedded analysts in the business units and and get them out of their departmental foxholes uh, to see the light of day. Uh, these forums essentially are a community of practice for data analysts to network, share tips, tricks, and code, so they don't have to reinvent everything all the time, which is what they are apt to do if left to their own devices. And this is done through in-person and virtual forums, uh, webcasts, hackathons, visathons, uh, and other types of events. Uh, and a lot of companies are starting to do this now, and I think they find it very effective. It's also good for the data analyst because they want to see more than their, their own department. And, and oftentimes, uh, the best data analytics programs provide um, kind of a, a rotation uh, program for the data analyst to switch their domain so they get experience across the company uh, and get a change of scenery every once in a while. That's also true for data scientists too. Okay, so this is an important part of the framework. Uh, now this next slide is gonna just dive into a little bit more detail. Uh, and let's just go through this one on one by one. So let's, let's focus with the, uh, what's going on at the corporate data analytics team in red. There's actually three teams, each of which I call a center of excellence. And by center of excellence, I mean a group of specialists whose job really is to build things, but also primarily to support what goes on in the rest of the organization. They're kind of a service that can be called on, upon to support and to build if needed. So there's three centers of excellence, each led by a director. So there's a business intelligence director who runs a team of BI developers, report developers essentially, who are specialists. Uh, in fact, they should have more technical expertise than the people in the business units who are also building reports. Uh, and they provide the first point of support for those embedded data analysts using those BI tools. There's also BI administrators, KPI designers, project managers, uh, and there should be a support function there, a help desk of sorts, ideally dedicated to data analytics, but oftentimes this is part of IT. Uh, there's a data management group uh, comprised of data architects, engineers, platform engineers, analytic architects, QA people, so on. So there's a lot of people here, uh, and they're building those repositories and data pipelines and data sets for uh, corporate use as well as business unit use. And then finally, there's an analytics team led by analytics or data science director, and that person manages a, a group of data scientists. Now, there's some debate of whether data scientists should be managed uh, and run centrally or decentrally. I prefer that most of them are centralized because data scientists are a different breed, very academically oriented, 
they need and want to collaborate a lot, to, to uh, learn new things, to get training, to, to keep their skills sharp, and also to mentor each other when they move into a new domain. Uh, that being said, they also need to be aligned uh, very closely with an individual business unit so they can learn the data, the people, the politics, and the processes, and, and can be more effective than what you can get from a data uh, analytical model that's been packaged into an application. It usually takes six months for an experienced data scientist to, to become more productive than a packaged commercial model. So on the right here, you'll see that um, there needs to be a partnership between the corporate data analytics team and the source system owners for the DBAs because uh, when they change something in the source system, it wreaks havoc downstream, right? So I've seen some companies use a change committee that meets frequently so uh, people can be made aware of any changes that are going to happen. Uh, more recently, we're seeing data analytics teams uh, use technology uh, and schema detection techniques to understand if something has changed, what has changed, and then automatically update their own schemas so that they don't uh, experience any hiccups. Uh, this blue box we've already talked about, that's where the business uh, unit analysts reside, uh, and they're managed by uh, an analytic manager. Now here's uh, an important area. This is where um, um, companies work between the business units and the corporate groups to build enterprise applications or complex applications or even complex local applications. Uh, and there's many ways to do this, uh, but companies have to pick an engagement model. Uh, and maybe they use more than one model, um, uh, and that's fine. Uh, for instance, tickets are a great way to um, uh, to gather requirements for uh, things that break, incidents, or very small projects that can be done in a day or two. You know, more operational type of things. That's a great way to gather requirements and build stuff. Uh, most companies use business analysts whose role is to um, essentially be translators between the local group and the corporate group. Uh, sometimes these folks are worth their weight in gold if they do a great job. Uh, to consolidate requirements uh, and to translate those into specs. But to be honest, uh, there's a lot of problems here. Uh, a lot of these business analysts are just glorified order takers. And what we really want them to be is relationship managers who spend most of their time in the business unit, maybe came from the business unit, understand the people there, the process, the goals and objectives, and are viewed as a colleague and most importantly, can proactively suggest solutions uh, to uh, the business before they even ask for it. That's the best type of requirement, right? Um, a lot of times these business analysts hand off their specs to a project manager who then engages a development team using some kind of waterfall or scrummer fall type of approach. Uh, more uh, recently, we're seeing companies engage agile teams to do this development work. Um, and some use what I call spanners. That's an individual who sits in the business unit, might be an analyst, to be honest, or at least plays that role, but who can also build out an entire application from soup to nuts, from requirements to QA, uh, as well as do the analysis. So that, that's a viable option. It's not very common for a variety of reasons. Uh, now, the, as far as the board of directors, we call this the Data Analytics Council, um, and it's comprised of two committees. The working committee uh, reviews, refines strategy uh, and plans and activities. It meets weekly to monthly, depending on how mature it is. It's formed from the uh, pool of managers of the business unit analysts. Um, and they have a lot of work to do. And this is kind of the muscle of the, of the whole data analytics program. Uh, as you can see here from the different subcommittees, not all working committees do all of these things, but I've seen them do these uh, from one company to the next. Uh, 
define data terms that aren't being defined in a data governance group, or at least take those terms and that they think are important and, and move them into a data governance program that might be enterprise-wide. Prioritize projects for enterprise development. Um, here's a big one, number three, for self-service. You need a way to govern reports. There's a huge process for that. In fact, my next webinar in this series will be about report governance and self-service. Defining tool standards, because uh, the corporate team can't support every tool out there. Uh, so it needs to put a stake in the ground. Even if business units ignore it, uh, they know what's going to be supported and what's not. Uh, there needs to be a lot of marketing communications to pull and stitch this whole program together. There should be data literacy and training to upskill uh, the people, uh, both the professionals uh, and the regular business users in the use of data and analytics. It's got to be a lot of focus on adoption, value, and satisfaction. Those are all important tasks of the subcommittee. Uh, and it's really up to the, the corporate directors uh, who run the centers of excellence to, to bring plans and ideas and strategies before the working committee for review and refinement. Uh, the executive committee really only gets involved once this program starts achieving a lot of value and results and it becomes much more demand than supply uh, then the sponsors, and these are, you know, usually CXO or, or high-level VPs, senior VPs, who will then decide, okay, who goes first, second, and third if there's a dispute? How much funding should we give this group? You know, maybe there's more demand. Maybe we should increase their budget so they can hire more people and go faster and meet more needs. So that's really the, uh, the task of the executive committee. And I wouldn't start that committee first. I'd, I'd let the working committee... Uh, get going, uh, show some results, and then then you'll find that you'll need an executive committee. Uh, and then finally, we talked about the analytics community of practice earlier, and I don't think I have much more to add to that. So I'm going to go through the rest of these slides a little bit more quickly. So this is kind of an org chart view, kind of an ideal view of a data analytics organization. Uh, and one thing to, to notice here is that it's uh, pulled out of IT and it reports to the chief data and analytics officer who, who reports directly to the CEO. Um, that's how I would like to see it done. I don't see it done that way too often, but when it is, I find that the people in that organization who are managing that organization find it works really well. Uh, you can see down to the left here uh, are the three centers of excellence that we went through. Uh, there's usually a data governance and master data management team um, that's broader than just analytics, uh, but that should also come under the domain of the CDAO. The company usually has an innovation lab where data products and services are, are being developed. Uh, there's probably a dotted line to that lab, to the CDO. Uh, the data infrastructure is run by IT department. Uh, that's obviously very important. I've seen some CDOs who have responsibility for infrastructure as well. Uh, that can make things easier to get things done. Uh, and then there's the security team, information security department, that should have a dotted line. Now, there's probably something I missed here, and I'd love to hear what you guys think. Okay, so uh, this companion report uh, also goes through a lot of roles that uh, this – data analytics program uh, might en entertain. These are all not full-time equivalent roles. Some are, uh, some are, are uh, about a third to a half are about part-time roles that might be shared. So one person might have two or three of these roles. But download the report uh, if you want uh, more um, detail on some of these roles. And of course, you can't have a good organization if you don't have a, a good underlying architecture and platform. Uh, and this is a diagram that is going to be in our upcoming report titled Unified Data and Analytics Platform, <laughs> or the rise thereof. Uh, and we're starting to see that vendors are beginning to build an end-to-end -end solution, which makes things a heck of a lot easier from an organizational perspective to get things up and running quickly at lower cost and speed time to insight. Um, 
so if you can avail yourself of this type of a platform, uh, I think you'll you'll get results much more quickly. Now, a lot of big companies aren't going to buy something like this. They have to piece it together, and they've got a lot of legacy components they have to stitch together, which makes things hard. And frankly, it's what keeps us consultants employed. Uh, I won't spend any time on this enterprise development life cycle other than to say that organizations really need to double down and nail this. Uh, there's a lot of sloppiness in each of these steps, especially the third one, uh, deploy, which is really where all the value comes from and in, in, in getting users to adopt what's been built and the company to actually experience benefits. Uh, so, in fact, there's probably more elements here than I've listed here. So, for instance, data ops is a really important component here. Marketing is a really important component of deploying. Okay, so in summary, um, I believe uh, you need to federate to accelerate. Um, and a federated organization model gives you the best of both worlds of centralization and decentralization. It's essential for self-service, something I'll talk about in my next webinar. Uh, it's important because it aligns all of your resources enterprise-wide. It, it doesn't create silos of resources. Uh, it stitches them together. Um, and it's also key to improving data literacy. Um, but there are challenges. Uh, this requires business involvement. The business has to allocate time and people to make this happen. Uh, it requires matrix reporting and co-location of some resources, and that's very tricky and nuanced. Uh, it takes some sorting out. Uh, we've helped a number of companies uh, do that, um, and it's also a cultural thing. Uh, it requires strong data and report governance processes. Um, standards are the only way you keep people in a federated and distributed world aligned. So standards and processes need to be nailed down and they need to be communicated effectively uh, for this to work. And as you might imagine, to do that requires strong leadership and communication. So with that, uh, we'd like to uh, present you with a poll um, about how you're using uh, a federated organization. So the question is, do you have a federated organization for data and analytics? So you should have seen a little question pop up uh, uh, like that and four answers. Yes, no, kind of, not sure. So why don't you check one of those? We'll give you about 10 seconds to do that. And then Deb, our admin, um, she will uh, compile the results um, and then we'll show the results and then we'll bring on our panel to, to discuss the results and um, take your questions. So after you've responded to this question, if you have questions, go to the Q&A button uh, on your Zoom panel and uh, submit your questions, which Jed will be reading through once we get to that part of the show. So uh, Deb, why don't you show us the results now? And then uh, when we see the results, um, and I assume you can all see those results. Let's see. Yes. Uh, all right. So why don't we bring on the uh, uh, all the panelists now. We're going to have them uh, actually show their video so you can see us live and in person. There's me. There's Rich Fox and Jed Somerton. All right. So, guys, we have... Uh, 12% said yes to this federated organizational model, 38% no, 48% said kind of, and 5% said not sure. Now, what do you guys make of that? Any ideas? Yeah, Wayne, I'm not really surprised by this. I think a lot of companies are still struggling with how to become data-driven and looking for a framework to really put in place to, to achieve this. And I think um, there are probably a lot of companies are either in um, one of the slides you showed at the beginning, they're either in that original decentralized uh, mode or they're in a centralized mode and they're trying to figure out how to go to the next level. Yeah, that makes I would agree. Uh, this, is, this is Jed. I think the folks who answered kind of, which is the plurality of the answers, 
are saying that we do this in some cases and not in others. So right. we have some uh, departments that have greater needs than others, and we have more of a federated, they borrow resources on projects, and they draw on centralized organization for result for specific expertise when needed. And uh, it's not a formalized program yet, and there isn't a formal request response or intake process. Um, we've seen that work a lot, and it's, um, it's on the maturity path. It's not formalized necessarily, but those organizations typically run into a couple of challenges of people saying, hey, I want mine, and when are you going to get to me? When am I going to have my federated resource come to my department versus the guy down the hall? Right. And what we find is that's where organizations have to start stepping up into some of the models that Wayne was showing. Now, yeah. one of the questions we have is... Uh, I'm going to go back to this model here while you're finishing up there, Jed, so we can... Yeah, talk. and those roles, uh, this model is for typically a fairly large and sophisticated organization. It's what you want to grow into, and it's, it's usually, it works well at scale. Now, not all organizations are going to work at that scale. You're going to have smaller teams. You're going to have combined roles. You're not going to have every piece of this. So you always have to adopt what you do from this model into your organization and consider things like maturity and also what we sometimes call organizational dynamics, properly known as politics, right? <laughs> you, always, you always have to deal with that. Uh, right. And, and it's, a, it's a conversation. It's a negotiation. Yeah. It's an evolution. Yeah. So uh, be patient with yourself. Okay. So I, I moved back to this uh, model that I presented. Um, I'd love to get your feedback. What, what resonated with you two? Uh, what you think is missing or a little bit askew? Uh, and Jed, hopefully you're also looking at the Q and A and yes, get to that. Yep. Okay. Great. Rich, any uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I I really like this conceptual model. So all companies want to be data driven today. Everyone you talk to, uh, they say that their company wants to be data driven and leverage analytics better. And many companies are struggling with that. And and um, I teach a, a program on, on how to become data-driven, and there are some keys to becoming data-driven. And this provides a framework to achieve many of those keys, in fact, probably all those keys. So just some of them quickly are, you need to align your data strategy with your business strategy, and the data and analytics teams need to partner with the business. Yeah. And this lays it right out for you. And then you need to build the right type of models and the models need to be business focused. I think some of us in the analytics business forget that the point of everything we do is to help the business make better decisions to improve business performance. So the models need to be business focused and you need input from, from the business teams as well as you need to build the right overall team. And this is a great framework for that. And then the last key I'll talk about is that you need to develop the right culture and a big part of the right culture is a data literate workforce. And I love your ideas down there at the bottom, the community of practice, the networking, the, the forums. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing lunch and learns for, for years. And I think what's important when you do those is that the head of the analytics group should not be the one up there talking to the business or to the other functional areas that come to these uh, uh, networking groups, but I try to get everyone in the analytics group involved and have them go through what they're working on and, and how they've approached this and how is this solution going to help the business. And I think connecting it back to the business and the goals, objectives, and initiatives of the business is really important also. Yeah. Well, what did you guys think of this dotted line here? Because this is probably the most controversial part of the whole model where these analysts who are embedded in the business units and who take their marching orders day to day from the business unit heads, they either have a dotted or straight line back to the, you know, the head of BI or head of analytics at corporate. I, and that the point is that these people take the what, their direction for what they should do from the business unit, but how they should do it from the corporate data analytics team. I, I actually think that dotted line is one of the keys to the model because, as you said, is that the federated programs gives you the best of both worlds. And to do that, you need to have the people developing the solutions embedded into the business and working hand in hand with the business. That's how they're going to be agile. And, yeah. and the thing is, you know, for, for years, uh, we've said 
business and IT don't speak the same same language, and and they don't get get along all the time. And now I'm hearing from companies that it's the business and and the data teams, and it's because the business wants answers very quickly, and the data and the IT teams and the technical teams they have processes and procedures that that need to be followed. And they're working with a lot of data and, and technical requirements. So to be able to leverage both sides of this and essentially have your cake and, and eat it too, to be able to develop business-focused solutions very quickly in an agile environment, but at the same time have follow things like good data governance, processes and procedures, a single version of the truth, both yeah. of these need to be connected. So I actually think the data line is one of the keys. Yeah, it, it is one of the keys, but I don't see many companies doing that. Uh, ironically, our, our current client has this. They've got uh, the corporate team hires all the analysts uh, for the business unit. And at first, the business units are not very thrilled about it. They lose some control, but then they realize they're getting much better analysts who are much better vetted. Yeah. Um, and then those analysts, uh, um, you know, come with... Uh, you know, they're, they're trained in, in how the company does things and that that's going to improve there. So it's a little bit, you know, losing control. I, I've also seen it go the other way where a corporate team had all the analysts centralized uh, and they gave all their analysts back to the business unit who paid their salaries uh, and retained the dotted line back to him so they could do like weekly standups and quarterly retreats uh, as well as their performance evaluations. So I, I've seen it work both ways, but I don't see it too often. Well, Wayne, I, I like to add a, a different perspective on it, com- complementary to yours and Rich's actually, is that to me, the dotted line is an opportunity for relationships, right? However formalized it is and which goes which direction, hopefully that becomes less of an issue than this is the team working together, right? And if we find uh, someone says, hey, I want my own, I'm going to take my ball and go home. Well, there's an opportunity for a conversation to say, you know, if you had some federated resources and you're willing to share, we've got some really strong services and a lot of value that we can offer to enable you to do things and perhaps go further than you could by yourself. So let's talk. And that conversation can lead to lots of things. And we have a, a, a question uh, from a man named Kurt in the audience. It says, Analytics translators is a role gaining a lot of buzz, and we didn't mention it explicitly, but we did have spanners on one of our previous slides, and that's what we mean there. Someone who is good at understanding the domain, good at understanding data, and also good at understanding how the data gets put together to meet the needs of the domain. And I think those people could be uh, riding that dotted line back and forth quite a bit. Hope that answers your question, Kurt. Well, um, I I would... I think what Kurt's asking about these analytics translators, I called um, um, these these business analysts um, over here, um, number two under engagement models. Some people call them BI analysts. Some people call them business requirements analysts. Some people call them relationship managers. Um, and uh, these have been traditionally used to build BI solutions. Uh, now they're being used to build data science solutions and models. Uh, and they really are the glue between, you know, the business unit and the, the corporate group. They, they are a purple person. We use that, you know, if you're a purple person, you have one foot in the business and one foot in IT. Uh, and they are supposed to gather requirements, consolidate, and then translate those requirements into specifications that developers can build. Uh, Sometimes they also build prototypes. Uh, If they're a little bit more technical, they can kind of prototype a dashboard with the business um, so that by the time it gets to the development team, it's much more fleshed out. Sometimes, most of the time, these guys sit at corporate and they're aligned, ideally aligned with an individual business unit. Uh, Sometimes they come from the business Um, That's an analyst who's taken it upon him or herself to kind of take the lead and gather all the requirements from his colleagues in his department and consolidate them um, for delivery to the to the corporate team. Uh, So it's definitely a a purple role. 
Uh, but I warn that a lot of times these people are just order takers. And if you're just an order taker, you're adding no value. In fact, you're probably subtracting value because things always get lost in translation. Um, and that's why you need more of a relationship manager who can proactively suggest solutions. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, a very, it's a very important role um, if it's done right. If it's, if it's not done right, I think it's a, it's a net loss to the organization. Well, I've got a question from Sherry who asks, what are some of the activities and in what order do you re recommend these activities to transition to a federated model? And I'd like to just set a framework that I think there is no way, better way to introduce some of these things than a real project or a real request that is in front of you. If somebody says, hey, I'd like to do this and say, well, we'd like to try a new intake process. We'd like to document some of these things, maybe some new roles and those sorts of things. Uh, so it, if you try to put it as an infrastructure without a real actionable plan in front of you or something people want to do, it makes it a little more difficult and it can come across as bureaucratic, even if necessary. So ideally, tying it to a new opportunity is great. But let me ask Wayne and Rich to elaborate further on what they've seen as far as what people do to move on up the maturity curve. Uh, I can go first. Uh, you know, I'm going to come up here to the, uh, if I can get my cursor there. You know, a lot of times we work with customers who are trying to do one of these things uh, on the subcommittee list. Uh, recently, we worked with a rather large U.S. retailer whose business unit analyst managers were so frustrated by the lack of consistency in their reports and conflicting metrics and data used in those reports that they banded together and decided they needed to do something. So they brought us in to help basically create a report governance process so that when people build reports designed for enterprise consumption or consumption across or outside of the department, that that report would have to go through some vetting uh, to get certified to ensure it was using the right metrics uh, and also uh, the right layouts and branding before it got the stamp of approval um, from this, this user-driven governance board um, and that would, you know, address a lot of pain that that organization was feeling. Uh, we have another client that the pain is prioritization. They've got a lot of these analysts in the business units, uh, but they don't have much or many resources to build enterprise infrastructure and solutions. So they have a project prioritization issue. So we're helping them you know, create this, uh, you know, governance model, this uh, federated program, as we're talking about today, uh, to support that pain point. Uh, data definitions are always a pain point. <laughs> and so how do you relate to the data governance program? Um, and how do you uh, foster more consistency in the way metrics and terms are used inside reports and dashboards? So I guess my suggestion is, follow the pain <laughs> and then use that pain to drive uh, greater collaboration among all the resources doing data analytics in your organization. Yeah, I, I would most definitely agree that um, with what, what both of you have said that whatever project or initiative you've got and where that pain is, that's probably where you're going to start. It's probably unlikely that many companies are going to develop a framework like this to, to start with. So you're going to actually start on an actual project and start to build from that direction. I think it's important, though, to have an overall roadmap and an understanding of, of where, where you're going. So um, even though you might be starting in a section of this and build out from there, having that roadmap is important. Well, yeah, that, that's actually, um, I would say the majority of the consulting clients we have ask us to do that data strategy, <laughs> basically address all of this at once, uh, plus the architecture um, and, and create that roadmap. Um, so that, that certainly is the, uh, the, the all in one way to get, get this moving. Well, it has to be all in one because it has to all fit together. You don't have to that's do true. it all at the same time, right? The roadmap can stretch it out a bit. 
as long as everybody sees the overall plan and where it's going, generally they're willing to get on board with it. Uh, and I say, another question I like to go about uh, just building on this topic is, Jason asks, what if the data analysts already exist in the business and they don't report to the engineering teams or, or the technical teams or the CBAO, right? Well, th there's some power and strength in that, of course, because they have good domain knowledge. And I'll go back to some of the comments earlier that if the data and analytics organization, the federated, the central hub of the federated piece, can offer value-added services beyond what they can do themselves, then that's an opportunity to provide those resources to them. Of course, there's always funding issues about how you accomplish that, but offering those a little bit at a time until they can see the value and then procure funding for that is an opportunity that uh, usually plays out slowly at first until the word gets out. And once the word gets out, people say, hey, these guys, are, they got it going on over there. You need to call them. And then it starts to take off. Yeah, I, I find that finance, marketing, sales usually already has a teams of analysts in those departments. Um, HR, legal tend not to have any analysts, and then uh, operations may have some. So the analysts already exist in pockets. And um, yeah, creating a dotted or a straight line between those analysts and corporate is a little bit politically sensitive. So that's got to come from the top. That's where your strong leadership comes from. But I've seen companies, um, like our, our current client did exactly that. They, they took all their analysts and had them report directly to corporate data analytics while leaving them embedded in the departments where uh, the department head gives them their day-to-day -day marching orders and projects to work on, uh, you know, using this this model that I laid out here. Um, and that that's working pretty well. It needs to be fine-tuned. Um, they need to adopt a pooling approach because one problem they experienced was that uh, when an analyst left uh, that department, uh, it was the only analyst they had, and then they were left high and dry, as I said earlier. So, um yeah, it's, it's a political move to create that data line if the analysts already exist, but it can be done. <laughs> Another question from Maria that says one role that she doesn't see in the chart is stylists and sometimes called data storytellers. Where uh, would that fit in this model? Well, I, know that I tend to think of data storytelling yeah. as a skill rather than a role. It's a skill that many people should have, but Wayne, you've been there as well. Well, I, I would agree with you. I think data storytelling is a vital skill that every data analyst needs to have. I mean, that's their job is to, to look at the data and then tell a story about what it means and what the company should do about it. So if they are not expert storytellers, and that goes for data scientists as well, by the way, they're you know, they're, they're a waste of money, to put it bluntly. Um, <laughs> you know, you can do all the analysis in the world, but if you do not tell a story that gets the business to change the way it does things for the, its own betterment, what is the point? So, yeah, data analysts need to be master storytellers. And we, fortunately, we've got some tools out there now that help in that. And, and we have some, there's such a demand for it that we have, uh, we have some training courses. We also have a webinar scheduled later this year about data storytelling. Right. Uh, and uh, so there's a little outside the scope of this particular webinar, but it is something that if you do not feel comfortable telling data stories, suggest you build your skills because it comes invaluable when you want to take something, as I say, upstairs to the corner office and say why you can how you came up with this number and why it's important to the business and what you recommend that the business do about it. Yeah, and, and I know this data storytelling has become a uh, hot term these days, but it boils down to that it's essentially just explaining the, the business purpose or the business focus of, of the solution and how does this impact decisions that are being made in the company and how can it improve business performance and, and drive and, and, and initiative. And that's why I think, you know, this uh, federated model is so effective because it, it is putting a lot of the analysts into the business and they're closely tied to the, to the business. Companies that I've seen where their analytics and their analytics team are not good data storytellers 
they're too far removed from the business and they don't really understand the business purpose of why the solutions are being developed. You know, what you said, Rich, made me think of, uh, it's kind of a non sequitur, but we are about to launch, or, or soon, I'd say within a month, a uh, online assessment where companies can evaluate uh, their data and analytics capabilities uh, as a whole and compare themselves to other organizations to see where they stand from a maturity perspective, where they're weak, where they're strong. And a lot of it revolves around this uh, organizational model. Um, but we also ask uh, things about architecture and data as well. Jed, any other questions? Uh, we do have another question. So uh, to expand, I uh, recommend to expand uh, data literacy, uh, Gene asks, would that lie in the center of excellence? Yeah, what do you recommend to expand data literacy within the centers of excellence? Um, I would think it, the hub of data literacy lies in data governance, um, in my view. Uh, but, and, but I think it's the role of everyone who understands data to help other people get to their level of understanding. And in that process, some very interesting conversations arise where you get to the nuances of some of the data definitions and you realize, hmm, it's not exactly, we're not exactly talking about the same thing. You come up with either, hey, we can align and unify or we need to have two distinct definitions and typically two distinct ways of uh, interpreting and using the data. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think the way the question was worded, uh, you know, the data literacy within the data centers of excellence. So with, within the, the professional community at corporate, those people obviously need to be trained and retrained and be given educational opportunities. Uh, Self-directed training is a good thing to get these people learning things that they're interested in that also benefit the company. But generally, we talk about data literacy for the general rank and file to improve their ability to uh, interpret data in charts and dashboards and even perhaps produce their own. And, you know, that, that takes a, uh, you know, if, we, if I go back to this slide here, you know, that, that takes uh, a lot of what's going on in step number three here. Uh, it takes user training through classroom on-demand, one-on-one -on -one meetings, especially the higher up you get in the organization, your corporate data analytics team should be spending one-on-one -on -one time to help executives use the tools and, you know, uh, look at the data because once they start using it, it trickles down uh, and it really spurs adoption. There needs to be a really strong support team dedicated to data analytics that people can turn to when they have questions and don't have one-on-one -on -one resources at their, uh, at their beck and call. Uh, you know, the, the, the data analytics team needs to be proactively tracking who's using what and who's not using what. And then, you know, going out and finding how they can make things better by department, by role, by individual user to increase adoption uh, and they need to, you know, understand what value is actually being generated by, by solutions. So um, all of that kind of figures into data literacy. Uh, but, I, you know, I think, a, a, and, and Rich, you may have a better idea here. Uh, you know, how do you we don't this? have time for a better idea. I have to cut in as moderator. Oh. We're at the okay. top of the hour. And I'd like to... Uh, Appreciate, thanks for all the questions everyone sent in, and I appreciate you attending as well. We will send a follow-up email with links to the ebook report and the slides Wayne presented and a replay of this webinar, so you'll get that in the next day or two. Finally, we hope you found this to be a good use of your time. If you did, feel, feel free to forward the links that you receive tomorrow, and if you use social media, we'd appreciate a mention. If you have specific feedback for us, and we welcome critique, please send it directly to Wayne at wayne at eckerson.com. That's it for today. Thank you, and we'll look forward to having you in our next community forum. Thank you, everybody.